Hi, my name is Sherry Trombley and I'm a student at Southwest Minnesota State University. And this YouTube video is for the class Ed 346, Section 71 called Children's Literature, taught by Dr. Michelle Beach. The author I chose to study is Margaret Wise Brown. I've been drawn to the book Goodnight Moon since my kids were babies. I enjoy reading this story to them at bedtime as well as my toddlers in my classroom at school. I like the poetic quality of her writing and now she can, how she can arrange the words in such a way to make the story sound almost dreamlike. Margaret Weiss Brown was born in Brooklyn, New York on May 23rd, 1910 to Robert Bruce and Maud Brown. She was born into a wealthy manufacturing family. Her grandfather was a senator and a candidate for vice president. She went to private schools in Switzerland and Massachusetts. She went to college to become a teacher, then realized she didn't really have an affinity for classroom management, but rather for individual children. She ended up going to the same college as her mother called Holland's College. She also went to Bank Street School of Education where she studied writing. She learned about famous authors with Gertrude Stein being her favorite. They both had similar themes that ran through their writings, love of color, joy in ordinary objects, repetition, and unexpected variation. The Bank Street School of Education put an emphasis on the here and now of writing, which proliferated her work. Margaret Wise Brown is most well known for writing the favorite children's book called Good Night Moon. However, many people don't know that she has authored more than 100 books during her short lifetime of only 42 years. Interestingly enough, in 1991, a trunk was discovered, which held more than 500 typewritten pages of new stories by Margaret Wise Brown. Within these pages were manuscripts for 73 new children's books. During her lifetime, she told people that she would go to sleep and dream up new stories. She would wake up and write down these stories, and by the time she wrote them down, more ideas would pour in. In the margaretwisebrown.com long bio, it says, she kept six publishers busy with her prolific output and created pen names to keep from flooding the market with Margaret Wise Brown titles. A few things caught my attention about her eccentric personality. Her friends thought of her as a creative genius and sometimes as a child that never grew up. They thought that was why she was such a good, good children's author because she saw and told stories from a child's viewpoint. She was a beautiful green eyed blonde and her friends and her inner circle of friends included the wealthy and famous royalty and American aristocracy. She dated the Prince of Spain and a famous New York attorney. She had a fascinating flamboyancy to her. Once after she received her first royalty check, she was walking along and saw a horse-drawn cart full of flowers, and she bought the entire cart. She proceeded to decorate her whole house with the flowers and threw her friends an extravagant party. She would sometimes hide bottles of wine in streams and shadows on her property so that friends would have a surprise refreshment on a hike. She even paid someone to put lobsters in her lobster traps to impress her guests. She once tied cherries and lemons to some of her indoor trees to make her guests think she had a green thumb. She encouraged her friends to think openly, and if one of them wanted it to be Christmas, she threw a party pretending to be Christmas. Her home was cozy and warm, and many of the things in her books came directly from her childhood home or bedroom. Margaret Wise Brown never had any children of her own and was never married although she did have a special talent of connecting with individual children and writing in the here and now perspective, wholly from the child's perspective. Let me share with you a few of the stories she wrote. One of the first books of hers I checked out is called Dirty Little Boy from 1939. It speaks of a boy who needs a bath, but his mother is busy washing laundry in the tub so she tells him to go out and watch how the animals clean themselves. In doing so, he gets even dirtier. Finally, his mother welcomes him back home 
and bathes him like a real boy. The next book I'd like to share is one of her more famous called The Runaway Bunny and it's from 1942. This book affectionately tells about a little bunny who keeps trying to run away from his mother as a trout in a stream, a rock on a mountain, a crocus in a garden, and a sailboat, for example. Each time, Mama Bunny finds him and in the end, welcomes him home with a hug. The next book from my collection is from 1944, called A Child's Good Night Book, and is also a Caldecott honor book. It is a small bedtime book where all the animals stop their noises and settle down for sleep. It ends with a prayer. Dear Father, hear and bless thy beasts and singing birds, and guard with tenderness small things that have no words. The next book is Margaret Wise Brown's most famous book called Good Night Moon, and you can see my copy is well worn. It was written in 1947. This story has long been in the hands of parents, rocking and lulling their children to sleep at night. Things like the fireplace and the picture of the cow jumping over the moon were things in her own home and childhood. Some of the pictures and ideas are also dotted throughout some of her other books. The little bunny in the book is saying good night to all the things in his bedroom. Good night comb and good night brush. Good night nobody and good night mush. And just when the predictable rhythm of stances is thought to be over, there's kind of a coda. Good night stars, good night air, good night noises everywhere. And that's how the book ends. She knew that children can sometimes be afraid of noises, so she wrote this to reassure and comfort the child. To date, Good Night Moon has sold more than 48 million copies, making it one of the best-selling children's books of all time. This book exemplifies the philosophy of writing in the here and now. Rather than write fairy or folk tales, she thought it better that children read about real things in their lives, things they themselves can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. The next book I'd like to share with you is called Love Songs of the Little Bear, first written in 1948. This book features four short stories, Love Song of the Little Bear, Green Song, Song of Wind, and Rain and Snow Song. Together, these stories describe different daily events happening in the life of the little bear. The Color Kittens is a book in this little Golden Classics, Three Best Love Tales books. Here's an example of the colored kittens. It's a cute little story following kittens around as they mix primary colors to make all other colors. They were trying to make green for cats, eyes, grass, streams of water, and glass. They discovered at last that yellow and blue make green, so then that made them happy. Two Little Trains is also a book from 1949 and it's an imaginative story that follows one real life train down the track, over the hills, through a tunnel, across a bridge, through a rainstorm and a snowstorm. All the while the facing page shows a toy train doing all the same things that the real train does. Just in a child's imagination around the house. The next book I'd like to show you is called My World, and it's a companion to Good Night Moon. This was also written in 1949. It features the same bunny as he sees all the things in his world, his very own house. It also ends in sort of a coda fashion, and just when you think the book is done, it says, my tree, the bird's tree, and it ends with a question, how many stripes on a bumblebee? sort of leaves it open-ended. The next book in my small collection is called Mr. Dog. The dog who belonged to himself. 
The main character is human-like with a two-story house, the same fireplace that we see in other Margaret Wise Brown stories, and Mr. Dog goes around doing whatever he wants. He meets a boy who also belongs to himself. They ended up living together in the dog's house and went to sleep after cleaning the house. Good night and sweet dreams. The next book was published after Margaret Wise Brown passed away. It's another favorite called The Big Red Barn, published in 1956. It features rhyming verse all about the big and little animals on the farm. Once again, the last three pages are a little of a surprise ending when you thought the book was already done. Let me read the last few pages and you'll see what I mean. The hens were sleeping on their nests. Even the roosters took a rest. The little black bats flew away out of the barn at the end of the day. And there they were all night long, sound asleep in the big red barn. You think that's the end, but it's not. Classic Margaret Wise Brown. Only the mice were left to play, rustling and squeaking in the hay, while the moon sailed high in the dark night sky. The final book I will share with you was also published posthumously in 1999, called Another Important Book. In it, we hear all about the important things of being a one-year-old, two, three, all the way up to six. The rhyming descriptions are timeless and accurate for all of the ages featured. And perhaps the best part of the book is the mirror at the end. Quite a surprise for kids who are expecting it to be over. So those are a few of the Margaret Wise Brown books that I've had to share with you, although there are many, many more. For a complete list of her works, you can visit www.goodreads.com. Just put Margaret Wise Brown in the search bar and you'll see the whole list pop up. I haven't mentioned the end of Margaret Brown's life, but I think it's really quite astounding. In the summer of 1952, she got engaged to James Pebble Rockefeller Jr., grand nephew of John D. Rockefeller. She went to France in the fall for business and ended up having an emergency appendectomy. She was to be on a strict bed rest. When it was time for her to leave the hospital, a nurse asked how she was doing and in a flourish, she said, grand, and jumped up and did a can-can kick. And unbeknownst to anyone, that kick dislodged a blood clot, causing an embolism, which killed her almost immediately. Her friends missed her terribly as the vibrant, childlike, flamboyant woman she was. Thank you so much for listening to my YouTube video about Margaret Wise Brown. Here's a list of all of the resources that I used to create this video.